um, as a campaigner for over 46 years, he must have started very young, uh, on issues of human rights, democracy, LGBT freedom, and uh, global justice. And from the late 1970s, he proposed a single comprehensive Equal Rights Act to harmonize the uneven patchwork of equality legislation, and to ensure equal treatment and non-discrimination for everyone. And that proposal was eventually secured with the passage of the Equality Act 2010. <laughs> Thank you, it is uh, very good to be here and what a sacrifice. <laughs> Texas, 25 degrees, Manchester, <laughs> but um, this is where home is. Um, I'd like to thank you for your very generous introduction, but just add a caveat. All those things you've mentioned uh, were things I've been involved in, but of course it was never me alone. Me, it was me working with other people, and as with every successful campaign for social justice and human rights, it's always a cumulative collective effort. So it's been our collective effort that, for example, won same-sex marriage, it's been our collective failure, which has not yet won equal civil partnerships for opposite sex couples, but that one is yet to come. Anyway, the context for tonight's talk um, is a world where organised religion plays a very major role, probably the most major role, in a range of human rights abuses around the world. If I was asked to name the single greatest cause of human rights abuses in the world today, I would probably say organised religion. <coughs> I emphasise organised religion because, of course, there are many people of faith, of many different faiths, who do not agree with human rights abuses and who defend the principle of universal human rights. Uh, notably, people like Archbishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa, who has been a beacon for the rights of women and lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. But overall, the single greatest threat is organised religion. And in many ways, the lightning rod are the issues of gender and sexuality. Women's rights and LGBT rights are the lightning rod on which religious fundamentalism seeks to roll back progress or prevent progress and maintain male and heterosexual privilege. Um, this is not a phenomenon which is uh, contained or um, within any particular faith. Shortly, the Commonwealth is to hold its uh, summit in Colombo, Sri Lanka. And right now, Buddhist fundamentalists and oxymoron, you would have thought. <laughs> Buddhist fundamentalists are targeting Muslim people and LGBT people for vicious, violent hate campaigns. Um, in Israel, Judeo fundamentalists are seeking to prevent women's advancement and recently, of course, tried to block and oppose women's right to pray at the wedding wall. They've also been behind attempts to try and ban or prevent uh, LGBT pride parades. In the United States, Christian fundamentalists have been behind attacks on abortion clinics and even violent attacks and murder against staff and doctors. Um, in Uganda and Nigeria, um, there are big religious fundamentalist movements, um, some Islamist, some Christian, which believe in witchcraft and witches and which terrorise people who they believe are possessed by witches' spirits and organise not only for the harassment of those people, but in some cases the violent assault and even murder of people they believe are witches. Now, of course, Uganda, uh, Christian fundamentalists have spearheaded the fight for the new anti-homosexuality bill, which would 
introduced the death penalty for certain types of <coughs> same-sex offences. And then when it comes to Islamist fundamentalists, um, we see that in countries like Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Syria, not only do they stand against the principle of universal human rights and democracy, but they even target fellow Muslims who do not conform to their particular hardline interpretation of Islam. So you've all recently heard of the horrific car bomb attacks in Baghdad and other Iraq, Iraqi cities where uh, Shia meeting places, mosques and markets have been targeted by uh, Sunni extremists who reject their fellow Iraqis who happen to be of the Sunni faith. Likewise in Iran, a Shia-dominated state persecutes its Sunni minority. Uh, and likewise in Saudi Arabia, we have the persecution of Christians. Many guest workers from the Philippines and other countries are of the Christian faith, and they suffer very severe uh, threats and even persecution for holding, for example, a prayer service in the privacy of their own home. Uh, recently, or a couple of years ago, a group of Filipino Catholic migrant workers were arrested for holding a private Catholic service in the privacy of their own home. So for all these reasons, for these different diverse examples of religious fundamentalism, I am a secular. Now, secularism is often conflated with anti-clericalism, i.e. anti-religion. It's not. It's very different. Secularism is about the separation of religion from the state. The notion that the state should be neutral on matters of faith. That no faith should be privileged above others. And when we look around the world, we see that wherever one faith is privileged over others, Almost invariably, the other faiths suffer persecution and worse. In Pakistan, for example, a million Muslims are victims of widespread discrimination, harassment, exclusion, and even downright murder. Likewise, Christians, in a whole series of horrific attacks upon Christian churches and the businesses of Christian Pakistanis. Um, that's what happens when one faith, or one particular faith, gets privileged legal state sanctioned status. So, the idea of secularism is to create a level playing field where no faith is privileged above another, and where people of no faith have equal rights with those of faith. That is the best way to guarantee both religious freedom and freedom of belief for everyone. So that's sort of the overall context, the overarching context of tonight's talk. The theme is really around the idea of gays and Muslims unite, fight, all hate. At first sight, it might seem incongruous, absurd <coughs> to suggest that gay people and Muslims could ever unite. <coughs> but of course, first and foremost, there are gay Muslims. There are Muslims who are lesbian, gay, bisexual or transgender. And some of them, not all of them, but some of them have found a way to reconcile their sexuality with their faith. So they have already, within themselves, unified gays and and of course, this issue is one that exists at a very challenging moment when we have the twin rise of the far right, the EDL and the BNP, who often target Muslim communities, and the equal rise of far right Islamists who seek to impose their particular interpretation <coughs> on everyone else. You know, the far right Islamists generally, their general goal is to establish a worldwide Islamist state or confederation of states where Islam is the state 
where the Islamic religion is the principle that governs all laws and the way the state operates. In other words, they want to establish a religious dictatorship. Now, in many respects, not all, but in many respects, the far-right EDL and the BNP mirror the far-right Islamists. Neither of them are genuinely committed to democracy and universal human rights. Both harbour prejudice and hatred. Both stir up intra-community tensions. And both are threatening and menacing in their goal and long-term intent. What is interesting is that some of the organisations who claim to exist <coughs> to fight fascism do not fight the Islamist version of fascism. Now first I'll add a caveat. Clerical fascism, as proposed by Islamist extremists, is not the same as classical fascism, i.e. the fascism of Adolf Hitler or Benito Mussolini. It's not even the same as the fascism of the National Front and the BNP. It is different, but the basic fundamental underlying principles, which are a negation of democracy and a negation of universal human rights, are essentially the same. So this clerical fascism has historically not been challenged by the left, or by most of the left, who have always had an anti-fascist agenda, and not being challenged by organisations like United Against Fascism. United Against Fascism has uh, played a major role in challenging, uh, as was the National Front, the BNP and the EDL. And I commend their efforts in seeking to oppose these violent far-right extremists and the hatred they spew against black and Asian people, Muslims and others. But they won't speak out against the far-right Islamists. In fact, some years ago, United Fascism invited to their major conference Surik Bol Sakrani, who was then Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, an organisation dominated by Sunni Muslims, who at least in private, many of them are very disparaging of Shia Muslims, Armenian Muslims and others. At the time, Sukh Balsakrani had been recorded on BBC Radio 4's PM program as denouncing gay people, suggesting they were sick and immoral and caused great social harm. Just weeks afterwards, United Against Fascism invited him to speak at their conference. He was echoing the very views and opinions of Nick Griffin and the BNP, which United States Fascism had so often <coughs> there. Yet they were prepared to give him a platform. They weren't prepared to give a platform to liberal progressive Muslims who accept the rights of women and gay people, but they were prepared to give him a platform. And when those of us criticised that invitation, we were denounced as racists and as homophobes. Well, we were not attacking Zerakwa Sakrani because of his race or even because of his faith. It was specific, bigoted, intolerant, far-right, homophobic opinions that we were challenging. As we would challenge the same opinions if expressed by Nick Griffin or any other far-right neo nazi To its great credit, Hope Not Hate, which has got a store here at tonight's meeting, is an organisation which is committed to challenging not just the BNP and the EDL, but also the far-right Islamists. Those who seek to stir up hatred against fellow Muslims who don't conform to their ideal, against those who seek to champion gender segregation, the 
separation of men and women in public meetings like this, and against those who justify terrorism and homophobia. And I've been working with Hope Not Hate, and twice this year already we have managed to succeed in stopping some of these hate preachers in whole going ahead with their meetings. Um, just um, a couple of weeks ago, the Palestinian charity Education Aid for Palestine was due to host an Islamist extremist feature at one of their conferences. Um, Hope Not Hate and my own Natasha Foundation contacted and lobbied the organisers. We apprised them of the kinds of views this man was expressing. Totally, absolutely illegal views if they had been expressed about black people or Muslims. Anyway, to their credit, as a result of Hope Not Hate's work, that speaker was withdrawn from the conference. Now, I don't know, to be honest, whether that's because they realised that he was, uh, his views were incompatible with their ethos, or whether they saw it as a necessary thing to prevent them from getting a lot of criticism. Um, I wrote them afterwards thanking them for taking the stand, but curiously, they never had any reply. So I'm a bit suspicious about their motives for withdrawing the invitation. But nevertheless, it's an example of successful lobbying where a hate preacher has been successfully blocked from speaking. And this is not because merely one disagrees with their views. This is because many of these hate preachers go beyond hate. They're not merely hateful, they incite or advocate or acquiesce or justify violence. Violence against gay people, violence against women who don't behave or dress appropriately, violence against fellow Muslims who adopt a faith that is different from theirs. So we must be very careful about restricting free speech, but when it comes to advocacy of violence, the justification of murder, then I think we have to draw a line, because incitement to murder is a criminal offence in this country and should be applied without fear or favour. Just as we would not tolerate the BNP or the EDL advocating violence or murder, nor should we tolerate such views when they're advocated under the cloak and guise of religion. So we have a situation now where in many parts of the country, even at universities, hate preachers are being given a platform. This is astonishing. Universities in Britain in the 21st century are giving a platform to hate preachers who defy absolutely the equal opportunities policies of those universities. They insist on gender segregation, that women must come into a separate entrance and sit separately. That's clearly incompatible with university policy on equal opportunity. Now, I'm not saying every university does this. We have recently twice successfully blocked these hate preachers from speaking at the University of East London. But they have spoken at Westminster University, Brunel University, and many other universities without any criticism or demurment by the university authorities. In fact, at Reading University, the university authorities only barred the preacher from speaking after anti-fascists, good anti-fascists, who are genuinely anti-fascism, threatened to protest against him. If those protests had not been called, the University authorities at Reading would have allowed that hate preacher to speak. They would have never allowed someone spouting race hate to speak. They would have never allowed a 
preacher espousing anti-Semitism to speak. But they were prepared to allow this hate preacher to speak when he attacked fellow Muslims, when he attacked LGBT people, and so on. When we look at Islam, we see a very different picture from that portrayed by the Islamists. By the way, when I talk about Islamists, I'm talking not about Islam or followers of Islam. I'm talking about Islamists. They are people who have elevated Islam into a political movement which they seek to impose on the rest of society to establish a religious dictation. That's what Islamists are. They're not Muslims, they're not followers of Islam, they are political Islamists who advocate and support religious theocratic behavior. Anyway, their view of homosexuality is very different from the reality of Islam's tradition. If you go back to the golden age of Islam, so-called, you will see that homosexuality was central to Islamic art, culture, and literature. Many of the greatest Islamic poets and scholars were gay or had same-sex relationships. When you look around the world today, homosexuality is incredibly common in all Muslim societies. Largely because of the separation of men and women, the pressure not to have sex before marriage, the requirement that women are virgins before they marry, and so on. So there's a lot of what I call situational homosexuality. In these deeply homophobic societies, there is more homosexuality than in contemporary Britain. I have friends who lived or worked for periods in Abu Dhabi, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and so on, and they say that sex with men is just like picking fruit from a tree. People who would never identify as gay are having gay sex. Of course, it's all covert, secret, and at considerable risk, because if you get caught in some of these societies, you can be put to death. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a disjunction between what the Islamists <coughs> claim as the authentic Islam and what is actually happening in most Islamic societies. Um, there are several Islamist regimes that have the death penalty for homosexuality. I mean, leaving aside the issue of the death penalty, which is completely incompatible itself with human rights, the death penalty for consenting same-sex relationships between adults where no one has complained and no one has been harmed. This is the reality in the 21st century in countries like Iran, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Mauritania, and parts of Nigeria and Pakistan the latter two being Commonwealth countries. Commonwealth countries where, in actuality, in certain regions, there is a de facto death penalty for same-sex relations. It shows that we may be living in the 21st century, but many people's minds, and indeed many, some countries' laws, are living back in the dark. At the United Nations, along with the Vatican, the Conference of Islamic States has led the fight to block any moves for women's rights or gay rights. It has sought to block the discussion of these issues in the United Nations General Assembly and in uh, bodies such as the United Nations Human Rights Council. Um, it is argued that these are incompatible with Islamic values. And these are not just the extreme states, these are also states like Malaysia, you know, another Commonwealth member state, actively seeking to block any discussion, let alone any agreement. Right of women to work, 
equal pay for equal work, and so on. But what's encouraging is that even in these hardline states, there are underground LGBT movements. In Iran, in the universities, there are LGBT people organizing, mostly covertly, at great personal risk, but some are sending out among the student body. They're taking incredible risks, because they're only going to take one other member of the student body to double them in, and they'll get a visit from the, the, the militia or the morality police and could end up either getting lashed or even put on trial and sentenced to death. In Sudan, where they have the death penalty, where we have a Islamist form of dictatorship, where the leader of Sudan is implicated in grotesque war crimes in Darfur and southern Sudan, there they have now a semi-open LGBT organization which has been in negotiation with the government. <coughs> Almost unbelievable. I have to check the sources, I have to speak to the people involved. But it's true. This organization has been set up in Sudan where there is a death penalty of homosexuality and they're not only organizing and educating other LGBT people and empowering them and supporting them, but they're also in dialogue with the government. That gives me hope. It gives me hope that Islam is not some monolithic, uniform thing. That there are different forms of Islam, and that even within the most repressive forms, there are moments and periods of hope. So back to the UK. Here in Britain, we have a pretty sorry history when it comes to even the mainstream Muslim organisations addressing the rights of LGBT people. Soon after the Muslim Council of Britain was established, as the main umbrella group of Muslim organisations in this country, it's the largest single group with hundreds of affiliates. Soon after it was established, I wrote to the newly appointed Secretary General Iqbal Sakrani. I said to him that I hoped that the Muslim community <coughs> would be able to stand together and challenge anti-Muslim prejudice, discrimination and violence. And that I would stand with them in that battle against anti-Muslim leaders. But I asked him also that he would reciprocate, that he'd be prepared and the MCB would be prepared to take a stand against anti-gay, anti-lesbian, anti-bisexual, anti-transgender hatred as well. I suggested that although anti-Muslim prejudice and homophobia are different, different rationale, different trajectory, different history, different cultural groups, although they are different, there are certain underlying fundamental things in common. In that Muslim people and LGBT people have a common experience of prejudice, <coughs> discrimination, harassment, and hate crime. And therefore, instead of fighting each other, we should be working together to challenge all hate. We should be working together to create a society where Muslim people and LGBT people can be free from harassment and victimization. I never got a reply to my letter. And I wrote to him again and again and again, year after year. I never, ever got a reply. In the meantime, when the big struggle for LGBT law reform began in the late 1990s, <coughs> leading to a whole raft of discriminatory, homophobic laws being repealed, the Muslim Council of Britain teamed up with Christian fundamentalists 
in the Christian Institute and other organizations to campaign against those law reforms, to defend discrimination, to say that there should not be an equal age of consent, that gay people should not be allowed to serve in the armed forces, that Section 28 should remain, that there should be no legal recognition of same-sex relationships, that there should be no protection for LGBT people against discrimination in the workplace. That LGBT couples should not be allowed to foster or adopt children. On every single issue, the Muslim Council of Britain and the Christian Institute and others stood side by side defending discrimination. I spoke to Sir I said, how can you expect anyone to take you seriously when you say that Muslim people should be spared discrimination, when you are supporting discrimination against other citizens because of their sexuality or gender identity? Again, no reply. So what happened? I decided that um, letters obviously weren't, weren't working. Phone calls weren't working. So I decided to make an approach to Inyat Bukhanbala, who was then the media spokesperson for the Muslim Council of Britain. You probably used to see him on TV very often about 10 years ago. A young guy in his late 20s, early 30s. I thought, maybe it's the younger generation I should go for. So I engineered for him to be invited to speak on a platform where I was speaking. And after our speeches, when we had some quiet time together, we had tea and coffee and everything, I got talking to him. I put him to this point, you know, discrimination is not a religious value. But if Muslim people want to be taken seriously, they have to oppose all discrimination, not just discrimination against themselves. We had a very, very long discussion. And quite clearly, Inyat had not really ever been challenged. He'd not really heard these points before. But to his great credit, he listened. He listened and asked questions. And we left that meeting with his commitment to try and change the Muslim Council group. Around the same time, there was another important person in the MCB, Abdurrahman Jafar, who was the legal officer, also young, university educated, born in Britain, I think. I engineered him to be on a panel, I think it was to debate uh, a motion at Cambridge Union. And over dinner, I got talking. I put the same points to him that I put to India. And he admitted that he had already been thinking about these issues. He said he'd been forced to think about them because, as a lawyer, he had been approached by a gay person who was seeking asylum. And although he felt there was a conflict with his faith, he had already decided that it was his duty as a lawyer to give that person the best legal defense he could offer. But again, at the end of the conversation, he went away and pledged to raise these issues within the MCB. Well, it didn't take very long. Within a year, the Muslim Council of Britain announced a change of policy. It said that henceforth, it would not be supporting campaigns to maintain anti-gay discrimination. So when the big legal battle, the parliamentary battle, took place to ensure protection against discrimination in the provision of goods and services to ensure that LGBT people will not suffer discrimination in the provision of goods and services, the Muslim Council of Britain announced that it would not be participating in the protests. The Judaic and Christian fundamentalist groups were horrified. They had lost a third of their army. And to its credit, the Muslim Council of Britain did not participate in those protests and issued a further statement saying they did not, be, did not wish to be involved in protests endorsing discrimination. So there you have an example of how
how a Muslim organization has transitioned, how change is possible, how there is a debate, a negotiation, a conflict, and a resolution going on within the minds of many Muslim people, including organizations like the MCB. So again, it reinforces the view that we need a more nuanced approach to Islam. We need to recognize that not all Muslims are the same. But there's a variety of different opinions and interpretations. And that generally, things are moving in a more liberal, progressive direction. Don't conflate the extremist fundamentalists, the Islamists, with the Muslim population as a whole. I know there are conflicting polls about what British Muslims believe, but in reality, in real life experience, things are changing. However, there is a dark cloud. After making that agreement in 2007-2008, the Muslim Council of Britain backtracked last year. They had a change of leader, a change of officers, and when the same-sex marriage bill came before Parliament, they voiced their opposition. They didn't do a major campaign against it, so I suppose that's, well, that's creditable. But they did express their opposition to it. <coughs> and they did sign some documents, along with Christian and Judeo fundamentalist organisations. <coughs> so we have gone a bit backwards. But then again, I would give us another example. What happened in Tau Hamlets. Tau Hamlets is often described as some kind of, you know, Taliban foothold in East London. And of course there are extremists there, very extreme people. But there are not. But nevertheless, in 2011, the EDL pledged they would march on Tau Hamlets. Quite clearly an act of intimidation and menace against the Muslim community. So I went there to that march, displaying placards, gays and Muslims unite, fight all hate. No to the far right BNP and EDL, no to far right Islamists. We had quite a tough time. We had quite a tough time. We got, we got a lot of threats. We were told, get out of here, you're not welcome. There's no place for gays in town hamlets. This is a gay-free zone. Uh, you can't be gay and Muslim. All Muslims hate gays. Uh, we, there were only two of us. We were manhandled. <laughs> we were manhandled by, by a mob. We were manhandled. Some even tried to punch and kick. But then, other Muslims intervened and said, no, this is not the Islamic way. These people have a right to be here. And we should thank them for coming to stand against the EDL. <coughs> Not to threaten and menace them. So it was a very mixed response. Overwhelmingly, I'd say, the response was negative and hostile. But there was a clear minority of Muslim people in town hamlets who were glad we were there and actually physically defended us when we were being threatened. Roll on two years, just last month, again the EDL threatened to march, and attempted to march, through East London. So as in 2011, I joined with the Muslim community and anti-fascist organisations to block their path and to defend Muslim people against the hate. This time, the response was very different. Muslim people came up and said, we're really glad you're here, welcome. Old men in full beards and traditional garb, who you would think were like hardliners, come up shaking your hand. I think we had three or four people who said, take those placards down, get out of here, you're not welcome. Three or four. We had dozens of other people who said the exact opposite. At one point, we were surrounded by an aggressive mob of young Muslim guys. But we spoke to them. We challenged them. We questioned them. Fortunately, one of our members was an openly gay Muslim who could speak 
Urdu, uh, they were Bangladeshi, and um, we began a dialogue. And gradually the tempers subsided, and the questions started. Why are you gay? What causes homosexuality? Can a Muslim person be gay? Are you a Muslim? Are you gay? <coughs> By the end, though, after about 15 minutes, those young guys, all of them, said in various ways, we're really glad to have this conversation, we've learned something. You know, peace to you. Now that's a positive sign. A positive sign of change. Now I'm not saying all Muslim people are now open to women's rights and LGBT rights. But what I am saying is these anecdotal examples would suggest that change is happening. But there is a debate going on in the minds of individual Muslims and in the minds of the wider community. A rethink about traditional views and expectations. I think it's really, really good to know that things are not as bleak and nasty as the BNP and the EDL portray. There's a lot of people out there who take a very simplistic view of what British Muslims believe. They are on a journey, just like we have all been on a journey. <coughs> Let's not forget that the criminalization of male homosexuality in this country only ended in 2003. Many people think that homosexuality was legalized in 1967. No, 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 no. <coughs> Far from it. The reform in 1967 merely stated that in certain limited, narrow circumstances, gay and bisexual men would not be prosecuted and jailed. All the anti gay laws remained on the subject books under the heading of unnatural offences. The law that sent Oscar Wilde to prison in 1895, was only repealed in 2003. The law against homosexuality passed by King Henry VIII in 1533 was only repealed in 2003. So we, as a society, have only fairly recently come to this place of equality. While we should not excuse homophobia or misogyny. We need to recognize that Muslim people and other ethnic minorities in our, country, in our country have often come from societies and cultures where there's been no tradition of liberal democracy, of human rights, of women's rights or gay rights. So it is going to take time. Of course we have to challenge prejudice whenever we find it which is why challenging the Islamist extremists is so important. But we also must realise and recognise that this cultural change, first of all, will happen, is happening, but it will take time. From the BNP and EDL perspective, you would think that at the drop of a hat, Muslims are going to take over this country and impose a religious dictatorship. That's absolute barking nonsense. There's a small Islamist majority who do want to do that and are prepared to use violent methods, as we saw on the 7th of July, 2005. But the vast majority of Muslims in this country do not share that extremist perspective. I'll just finish by reflecting on what the Qur'an actually says about homosexuality. It is amazing how many Muslim people are ignorant of their own faith. They've imbibed views that have been sold to them by self-appointed clerics who have got little or no theological understanding of Islam. When it comes to the Qur'an, there is no explicit condemnation for homosexuality. Some texts have been interpreted to condemn homosexuality, 
but it's just an interpretation. Moreover, there is no punishment specified in the Quran for homosexuality. No punishment at all. In fact, many of you will know that in my passage of the Quran it says that righteous Muslim men will in heaven be rewarded with boys as beautiful as her. Interpret that the way you wish. <laughs> the really damning things about homosexuality, about the role and status of women, come from the Hadith, the sayings or alleged sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. <coughs> and as we know from textual scholars, uh, these so-called sayings were not the word Muhammad himself actually wrote. They're a collection of sayings from different scholars, and you can see it in the different style of the text, that there are many different authors in many different periods. But on top of that, on top of that, the Quran itself actually states, this book is perfect. It is complete. It requires no additions and no interpretations. You must follow this book alone and follow no other books and no other teachings. So, by a true Quranic understanding of Islam, the Hadith and Sharia and all the other man-made interpretations are irrelevant and anti-Islamic. <coughs> now that's another big debate that <laughs> we have to have. But some people in the Muslim community are having that debate. And I think we need to encourage, support, and become a platform to those voices within the Muslim community who are struggling to reconcile Islam, democracy, and human rights. I think back to a number of years ago, one of the most famous ayatollahs in Iran, the son of one of the greatest grand ayatollahs of Iran, a colleague of Khomeini. His son, um, Ayatollah Khwani, some years ago, issued, uh, I'm not sure what the status was, I don't think it was a fatwa, but it was a, a, a theological statement, which sought to reconcile Islam with democracy and human rights. He had to flee Iran for fear of being arrested and executed as an apostate. After spending a while in Qatar or Abu Dhabi, he eventually came to Britain and myself and others supported his bid for asylum, which was eventually granted. He's now a resident in this country. He is trying to articulate a new modern reform Islam, where democracy and human rights can be reconciled with the faith. What I found really shocking is that I tried to get the Guardian newspaper, supposedly Britain's great bastion of liberal journalism, to publish an edited version of his statement. They turned it down. At a time when they were giving a platform to Islamist apologists from the Muslim Brotherhood and others. That's really, really sad. If a liberal paper cannot give a platform to a liberal progressive Muslim, or at least a Muslim of great theological stature, who is seeking to move the faith towards a reconciliation with democracy and human rights, then what hope do we have? Well, I don't think the world revolves on the editorial policy of the Guardian. <laughs> so, in conclusion, um, I can see Islamist extremists who are making threatening noises, who are terrorizing fellow Muslims. I can see the danger they represent, the damage and harm they're causing. But I also see the process of change going on in Muslim communities. I live just 150 meters from a mosque. 
Probably a third of my neighbours are Muslim. I've never, they all know I'm gay. I've never had any problem. They're as polite and as courteous as possible. I'm invited into their homes. I go to an affair with one of their sons and they eventually accept it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the world is changing. The world is changing. And that is the great hope that we must have. That people can change. That things may have been this way for a long, long time, but they can change.
is severely limited. And one of the problems is, of course, the United Nations has all these wonderful conventions. Conventions against war crimes, conventions against genocide, conventions against torture, and so on. But when it comes to mechanisms of enforcement, <coughs> it is woefully inadequate. Um, you know, to get peacekeepers anywhere is a real, real struggle. Because, of course, so many countries with vested interests have vetoes, and they use their vetoes. So one of the things I would like to see is a new UN mandate for a permanent or rapid reaction peacekeeping force made up of multinational uh, troops from many different countries, but operating under unified United Nations command, not British or American, which would be tasked to go into conflict situations to try and stabilize situations. So for example, in Syria right now, it's a classic example of where UN peacekeepers going in, even against the will of the Bashar Assad regime, could play a very important role in intervening between the warring sides to help de-escalate the conflict and reduce casualties. Thank you. Thank you. Um, about eight years ago, um, I went to the mosque in Manchester and talked to the Imam, and he uh, justified the execution of gay people to me. Uh, that had a brief flurry in the press. And I tried after that to find people to talk to, and I found it incredibly difficult to find anyone who would talk to me. And I backed off because I got a bit scared. Uh, frankly. Um, and I realized that the work of the Korean Foundation and possibly um, Gay Ha or Gal, Gal Ha might be a way forward, but there's no branch of the Korean organization in Manchester. So I'm looking for your advice about how you find people who might talk to each other. Because standing in the street of black houses brave, but I'm not as brave as you are. Well, I certainly agree that the approach you took in seeking to have a dialogue is a very good, practical one. And sometimes it does work, and other times it doesn't. Um, you know, I think probably, in terms of a dialogue, it probably needs some institutional structure. Mm. So, for example, if Great London, uh, Great Greater Manchester uh, Humanists together with the Gay and Lesbian Human Association, and maybe together a few other organizations, uh, sought uh, an open dialogue meeting with the council of mosques for all Manchester, rather than an individual imam. That might be the way to go. Um, there has been some dialogue in London between LGBT groups and the East London Mosque, which is the main mosque in Tower Hamlets. And I would say that has reduced, not entirely eliminated, the um, speaking engagements of extremists in the area. Um, so that's, that's the way I would go. I try, try and get you know, a, a group of organisations to make a joint approach to the Council of Mosques um, and see how it goes. Can I just um, add that, that um, there is an embryonic northern LGBT group in, in Manchester which actually needs somebody to 